has surged during lockdown, with adults in the UK spending a record quarter of their day online. That's according to the communications watchdog Ofcom, which says the biggest rise was among those over the age of 65. Our technology correspondent Rory Kettling-Jones has more. From cabinet meetings... And the law is... practice... ..to exercise classes, much of life has moved online over the last few months. The average adult now spends more than four hours a day connected to the internet, half an hour more than last September. Much of that time involves video, either watching it or using it to make calls to friends, relatives or colleagues we can't meet face to face. Video services are booming. The TikTok short video platform had 5.4 million visitors in January. By April, nearly 13 million were turning up. The video calls and games app House Party had under 200,000 users in January. By April, 4 million were using it. At the beginning of the year, under 700,000 people were having business meetings using Zoom. By April, 13 million were using it for everything from Pilates lessons to pub quizzes. For many of us, this has become the new normal during lockdown, locked in front of screens of all kinds for both work and entertainment. And it seems this applies to all ages. Often it is the younger people who uh, adopt new technology first, whether that's smartphones or social media. Uh, but in this case, we've seen the use of video calling double during the pandemic. And for the over 65s, they've been embracing the new technology to reach out and spend time with grandchildren and loved ones often using the technology for the first time ever. The lockdown period has also seen a surge in creativity. Making videos for sites like TikTok, YouTube and Instagram is now something the majority of children over eight say they do every week. Rory Kathleen jones BBC News. It's like a real change to the programme today mm. because we are because things are changing, we are out and about in all sorts of different places, including looking at what's going to happen, for example, with pubs and restaurants. Jane McCubbin has gone to the pub a little bit early, but she won't be drinking. Morning. <laughs> Good morning to you. Hands up who's desperate for that first pint in a pub. As long as it's safe, yeah, me. Uh, we're in the Atlas Bar in Manchester City Centre with Mark and the team this morning. In a word, Mark, because we'll have a proper chat with you in a second, how do you feel about July the 4th? Massively relieved, but also quite anxious about safety. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be done right. It's Absolutely. got to be done right. Well, Mark's here to help us guide through what your boozer might just look like. Step into the Atlas Bar on July the 4th, and this will happen first things first. OK, good. Good to go. Thank you. Temperature check. You will have to download the app for this bar, and it does four things. One, it tells the bar who you are and your contact details. That's important for track and trace. The government wants bars to have a record of who's inside at any given time. It tells the bar where you're sat, what you want, and when you leave so that they can clean the table afterwards. Have a look around as well, and you'll see £320 these perfect perspex screens are. All of these are in place to keep people safe. The problem in this place, is it not, is the toilet. Tell Absolutely me about right. the toilet. So we've had to get a door installed. We've had it slightly shorter so you can see the mirrors all the way up so no one else is on the stairs. We have a lock and a mirror that goes through to the, um, to the bar there. And Kale's going to open the door for us in a second. There we so go. So it's one in, one, one out. One in, one out. No yes. queuing on the stairs, nice and safe. Walk through the bar with me. And you'll see more Perspex screens up here on the bar where Kale is getting ready. Good morning, Kale. Um, nobody's allowed to queue here for drinks anymore. Everybody has to stay in their seats. And speaking of seats, have a look at this. This is just a small proportion of the tables and chairs that have been taken out because even with one metre social distancing, they've still had to clear out a lot of their trade. Come and meet properly Mark and Elaine now. Hi. Good morning to you both. I mean, this is going to cost you, isn't it? Oh, certainly has done, yeah. I mean, we've certainly invested thousands and thousands of pounds um, in preparations and um, trying to preempt and get things right to keep our team and obviously our customers safe when we reopen. And really, Mark, this is just guesswork because when Absolutely. you log on the government website, yeah. it says guidelines to follow. How do you feel about that? Nobody's told you to do this. It's all been guesswork. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's been a challenging time just trying to figure out and guess what's the best thing to invest our money on. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you think it should have come sooner, those guidelines? Like on the day they announced the date? <laughs> I think we'd certainly, there's been so much speculation about July the 4th and Independence Day, uh, kind of ironically, but we did think that the guidelines would come down onto the website at some point late yesterday because there's been a working party yeah. looking at it. So it was disappointing that it's still somewhat vague, but we genuinely believe that the things we've invested in are going to make the difference for... Um, everyone that's at Atlas, be it customers or the team. Okay, well thank you very much. We're going to stay with you throughout the morning and chat to you later. Thank of you. course the situation is different in Wales and Scotland. They're going to review in early July. In Northern Ireland they've got that opening date of July the 9th for bars and restaurants there. But at the moment with two metres social distancing. More on all of this later. Back to you. Um, do you know, Jane, it's absolutely fascinating to see the changes that they have made. Um, and thank you, we announced yesterday that many businesses in England would reopen in early July. There are some sectors where the doors have to remain closed. Indoor gyms and swimming pools are among those that are not yet allowed to open, despite many of them putting uh, measures in place to try and protect both staff and customers. This is something Tim Muffett has been looking at. The uncertainty goes on and on. For indoor gyms like this one in Northampton, lockdown has meant no workouts, no weight training, no income. We're obviously disappointed by the news that we can't reopen our gyms on the 4th of July, but we're more disappointed for our colleagues and our members who we know are desperate to come back. Those who run this gym believe it could open safely. We've installed some screens between our treadmills. The purpose of these is to make sure that we can keep as much kit in action as possible whilst keeping our members as safe as possible. So the Perspex screens sit about two metres high, they're wrapped around the treadmills, and our cleaning teams will be on hand to wipe them down regularly throughout the day. More screens are about to be installed. Each treadmill will be self-contained. Do you think that will detract from the workout experience? I think anything we can do at the moment that helps make our, our members feel safer is going to be a good thing. We've bought one of these for every gym, which is an electrostatic cleaning gun that at a push of a button sterilises a piece of equipment like this. And as numbers inside will be strictly controlled, gym members will be able to check them in advance. So they can quickly check this before they come down to see how busy or quiet the gym is, so they're guaranteed to get in without queuing. Expensive investment this gym's felt compelled to make. And whilst Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden tweeted yesterday that the government hopes indoor gyms can open in England in mid-July, the sector is calling for clarity. There are more than 7,000 gym and leisure facilities across the UK, with more than 10 million members. Now, collectively, they're thought to be worth more than £7 billion to the UK economy. Humphrey Cobbold runs the chain Pure Gym, which has more than 1 million members. These were described, I think, as sort of close proximity venues. Um, well, my average gym is about 17,000 square feet, which is about the size of five or six tennis courts. Um, and in my book, um, that is much less of a close proximity venue than the average pub, which is, what, seven or 800 square feet. So I am a bit confused by the application of science. We hear about the so-called Joe Wicks effect, people working out at home in their gardens. Do you think people will actually want to go back to a gym? I do believe that um, gyms provide and facilities provide a particular environment that people uh, want. Uh, there's nothing quite like a live exercise class. Uh, most people uh, don't have... Um, a uh, Olympic lift platform or a, a weight stack um, in their front room or in their bedroom. Most people don't have a treadmill at home. If there's one lesson that we've learned from the last few months, it's that your health and your fitness really does matter. But others believe indoor gyms should stay closed for now. Dr Claire Taylor's a microbiologist. The big dangers in the gym is the fact that people will be uh, touching lots of different surfaces, so there will be... Uh, obviously exercising, there'll be, there'll be sweat, people will be touching their face a lot um, and then potentially touching lots of different gym equipment. I mean, perspex screens may well um, help, but then you would imagine that, that the screens will end up covered, covered in uh, uh, kind of respiratory droplets um, and could end up being a real uh, potential site for, for contamination. One of the safest places to exercise is of course in, in the outdoors, where the risk of transmission is far reduced. Back in Northampton, the machines have been spaced out and spruced up. They just need people to use them. So do you think then that when people come back, there's, there's going to be some things, some changes which you've had to make 
which could actually be better. Yeah, I'm really confident, especially in the weights area here, having a bit of marked out space that you can have as your own whilst you train could be really important. We're going to work so hard making sure that our, clean, our gyms are clean and hygienic. It's been a tough time for this sector. It's hoped the finish line isn't far off. Tim Muffett, BBC News. It is uh, nine minutes past seven, a really packed programme for you today. And one thing we're trying to do is take you out and about and try and address some of the changes that could potentially be happening over the next ten days or so, in England particularly. Yeah, the Prime Minister called it our long national hibernation, saying is beginning to come to an end. I'm setting out plans to reopen parts of the economy in England from early July. Now, we're concentrating on lots of things this morning, including what's happening in the pubs, mm -hmm. restaurants as well. What, though, does it mean for holidays, for the tourist industry? Sean is in Blackpool <laughs> with his shorts on. Legs out, Sean, legs out. Morning. Well, it's going to be 20 degrees in an hour's time. We're going to be on the beach, so you've got, it's got to be done. Yeah, morning, everybody. Uh, such an important announcement yesterday for so many businesses. The campsite I was at, they'll be happy that they can reopen in early July. And lots of other restaurants, B&Bs, hotels in England will be looking for that date as well. But you go on the gov.uk website and it still says further guidance on its way. So how a business is going to be prepared for that? Lots of them in Blackpool needing to get ready. One of them is uh, Merlin Entertainments, who uh, have a, a, lot, a lot of places in Blackpool. Morning to you, Kate. Good morning. Yes, we have seven visitor attractions in Blackpool along the uh, beautiful promenade. Including uh, the tower that's Including behind you. Including Blackpool Tower that's behind us, yes. So you got the announcement yesterday. We did. What does that mean for the variety of you know, museums and entertainment places that you have? What's on and what's not? OK, well, for us, it means we can open three of our seven visitor attractions. So we're going to open the Sea Life, Madame Two Swords and the Eye attraction, which is the top of the tower. Um, we, can, uh, we can guarantee, reassure our visitors that it's going to be safe when they come in because of the measures we've put in in those three attractions. The attractions that we're not going to open at this stage, because we need to understand further from the government what they want to do, is the ballroom, the circus and the dungeon, because there's actors obviously involved in that. So are you ready? Do you think, have you got the guidance you need? We are still on picking the guidance. It only came out yesterday. We've done a lot of work. We've got a great health and safety team at Merlin. They've been issuing information through to us we've got screens in there the PPEs already they've created some amazing training videos for our staff so when they come back to us You're they're all gonna, we're all going to be ready okay. we're reducing capacities and getting people through on time slots so they will be safe throughout the visit well, you've obviously got a lot of staff in uh, who will be reliant on that thank you Kate uh, so that, that's Merlin Entertainment who a big employer here but Blackpool as a whole such a huge, important industry, uh, tourism. And, and Alan, you're from Blackpool Council. Um, we just heard about sort of what Merlin are up to. The wider sort of town centre here, what's going to be open, what isn't? Well, the uh, Pleasure Beach is probably the biggest other attraction will be open. The piers, uh, the zoo, uh, and uh, the arcades, uh, and of course the pubs and, and restaurants will be open as well from uh, from the 4th of July. So uh, quite a lot is open, but there's quite a lot not open as well. What's, so what kind of things then are you being prevented from opening? Well, uh, critically, uh, theatres are still not allowed to open across the country, and... Uh, uh, and anything that's a wet area, so spas and things, but we have our own Sandcastle Water Park, an indoor uh, water theme park, which uh, also can't open at the time. Merlin are a big business and they've been able to, you know, put a bit of money into the preparations around this. For all the small businesses we can see, you know, right across Blackpool, many much smaller than that. Have they been able to get as ready as they need? Is the guidance enough for them right now? Well, they can do whatever they can do, but the guidance isn't quite out yet, and we really need that guidance for those businesses to help them to, uh, to, to be able to trade safely uh, and to understand what that means to them. Alan, thanks very much. Um, uh, so, yeah, businesses want to get ready for that date, but do they necessarily have all the guidance? We're going to be talking to a few more a little later, B&B owners, ice cream van owners, about how the difference in tourism and the boost that they will see, hopefully, in the coming weeks, what difference that will make to them, and also what impact that might have on the town. What time are you down on the beach, Sean? Uh, about uh, quarter past eight, I think, something like that. Yeah, okay. the sun will be right across it by then. And then what does that mean for our summer holidays? Well, Sean is in Blackpool this morning. Um, he's got various guests for them. He's also got one of those lovely long microphones we're getting very used to. Morning to you, Sean. Looks absolutely lovely there this morning. 
It is really glorious. It's starting to get quite warm now as well. We're here on the beach, on the, the comedy carpet at, in Blackpool. We've got the tower, which will be one of those things that will be opening in a few weeks' time, next to the dungeons, which won't be opening because they still need a bit more guidance over what's materialising there. And you, you can just see why a lot of people would want to come to Blackpool and start their holidays, going to see events that they haven't seen before, but they're having to wait for a fair bit of the guidance for all that. We've got Morris uh, with me, who, as you can see, runs an ice cream uh, ice cream van. Morning to you, Morris. Morning, Sean. How are you? How, uh, these rule changes for you, obviously. I mean, you've been able to sell ice creams uh, for, for a good few weeks. What, what difference does it make to you, what we heard yesterday? Right, the, the biggest difference is the um, announcement that caravan parks can reopen, because 50% uh, of my work and my income comes from local caravan parks. So um, great news that from the fourth they can reopen. I think it's going to take a, a few weeks before we actually start seeing the holidaymakers filling the parks up again, but it's positive news and still leaves us with a few weeks to try and claw some of it back because our season is very limited. Uh, we normally start Easter and we're seven days a week, week right through to September. Step so, in the right direction so, then. Yeah, so can you uh, give us, give us uh, an example of uh, how exactly you'll be Making a sort of still socially distanced uh, yeah, sure. ice cream, so okay. you, you just go you just go ahead and, and make it there for us, uh, Morris. We'll have a look at the end results in a moment, well because uh, you've got screens to pull across and things like that. So you know, Morris is a good example. 1.5 billion pounds spent in the tourism sector in Blackpool over the course of a year. 18 million visitors. Lots of small businesses like Morris affected. Another is Shirley who runs a B&B, and uh, she's taken us round her site to give us an idea of the preparations and what it will look like when she can open properly in a few weeks time. Hello, hi, welcome to the Cranston. Come on in. This is a check-in area now. We used to have the check-in area in the bar, um, but we feel that the less sort of space that we need to utilise, the better. This area used to be where we used to keep all our leaflets, which at the moment we're not displaying or distributing any leaflets out. On arrival, all our guests will be given a check sheet and on that check sheet um, will be one specific area which is mainly the stairs and the hallways. I really, really um, want the guests to keep a safe distance by, from each other, either by um, um, stepping back and letting the guests come down the stairs um, or holding, you know, letting a guest come in through the front door and then you waiting you know, for someone to come up the stairs. And please just consider each other uh, for your safety as well. We've not really got any guidelines as yet as to specifically what we are allowed to do and not to do, apart from the two metre rule. So I've decided for now, I think this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to invite the guests down to breakfast, maybe at a specific time. I am then, instead of coming through to the dining room, I will be using the arch where the, where the guests can get their own breakfast from and also be limiting um, any pastries and cereals. Everything really will be less contact, the, you know, for us the better. Like I say, it's going to be trial and error, no specific guidelines. So hopefully, you know, I'll learn as I'm going to go on. For us, we won't be open until around about the 24th of July. That's when we'll welcome our first guests in. Wearing shorts this morning. So, so yeah, you can see there the you know the, the preparations that people have to make. Shirley's joined me now in a, what a spot this is, Shirley. I mean, this this is what you want, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely amazing. Look at it. Where else would you like to be in the world? And a lot of people are going to be thinking that now over the next few weeks. What are you expecting once you know July the fourth comes here? In well. England? I mean, it's it's needed, isn't it? You know, we want to welcome back all our tourists. For weeks and weeks, we've been staying, saying everybody stay away, um, but we want to welcome back all our tourists um, and our guests and visitors. Um, so, from the fourth of July, yes, most people are getting preparations done. And we we just sort of saw there, you know, the preparations you're making at your B and B. Uh, are you expecting to be able to make up any lost ground that you've had in the last few months? Um, no, I, I don't personally think that I will, no. I mean, like I say, everybody's circumstances are different, but I don't think we will personally make up what we've lost. We've had the best start to a year that we've had in the 20 years that I've been here, with the weather-wise, you know, the best Easter and then all the bank holidays. Um, it's great that we're extending the illuminations, so, um, so that might bring in, you know, so long as people know that the illuminations are running through to the 3rd of January. 
And you know, as somebody who lives here as well, and not just running a business, but you're a resident here, how do you feel about all of a sudden lots of people flocking to your town? Uh, you know, given alongside the whole economic issues, clearly health questions as well. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a bit apprehensive, I must admit, you know, and I'm worried about people, like I say, when I, I think I said on the video that people coming into my guest house, I have got a concern only because I think of health issues and, every, you know, I personally have a, a diabetes, so um, it is a bit of a worry, you know, for people coming in. It'll be strange seeing lots of people around where it's been usually very quiet. And there's something, isn't there, about the lockdown period that maybe you're used to seeing beaches like this nice and quiet early in the morning, but for yeah. a lot of people, this is, is not a normal sight when the sun's out and Blackpool in the middle of the day and that's what it's been like. It's going to be quite a change. It is going to be quite a change, and yeah, and I do feel really lucky and privileged that I live here. Why wouldn't you when you walk down, you know, the road and this is at the end of your street? Um, but yeah, yeah, we are going to welcome back, but so long as people just adhere still to the two metre rule or the one metre rule, then I think we'll be OK. Shirley, thank you uh, for inviting us in and being here with You're us very th this morning. Um, might even, I don't I need to check with the rule changes, whether it means we have to change the, the length of this microphone in a few weeks' time. But there'll be lots of things for people to have to deal with. Businesses wanting to reopen, but still a lot of them needing a bit more guidance than they might get online right now. Sean, do you know what? I've been absolutely mesmerised, not by just what you're saying, obviously, but um, <laughs> the view as well and trying to spot you in that <laughs> glorious scene there this morning. You couldn't have gone for a better day, could you? It's just by that. It's just by the uh, it's, shadow it's, of the tower, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the shadow of the tower. Any criticism of wearing shorts, I think, has long disappeared now. Agreed. When you see see okay. the weather here, you, it's uh, you know it's the right thing to do. It is, isn't it? We've sent um, Carol as well to Kew Garden, so thank you both very much indeed. Also, we're talking about, so there's so many changes mm. coming, aren't there, including what's going on with pubs and restaurants. We've sent Jane McCubbin to a bar in Manchester. Good morning. Okay, oh, right, OK. Hello. Can you hear us? Good morning. We are live in a bar in Manchester because we want to tell you what it's going to look like and feel like when you step back in your boozer on July the 4th. So first things worth, this is Mark who works here, who owns the place. This is what he will do. Morning. He is Good taking taking a temperature. Tell me if I'm safe, Mark. You're very safe. Very safe. Taking the temperature to tell if you're safe to come inside. Before you get your pint and take it to a table behind your Perspex screen, you have to download the app for the pub. The app does four things. It tells the staff who work here who you are and your contact details, which is essential for track and trace. It tells them where you're sitting and what you want to order, but it also tells them when you leave so that they can bring somebody over to clean all of your space. Of course, you have to wash your hands on your way in and on your way out and whenever you want to over the course of your stay here. The toilets are now operated on a buzzer system, completely controlled by the bar staff, one in, one out. Really, they don't want you to be anywhere other than the table or, if necessary, the loo. So the staff are all ready to go behind more Perspex screens. These cost 120 quid each, the big one's 300. This is Kale. Good morning, Kale. Uh, how do you feel about coming back? Obviously, I do feel a little bit anxious, but I know we're taking every precaution and measure to make sure it's safe for the customers and staff. Yeah, so, yeah. Looking excited? looking raring to go because some staff here have had to lose their jobs they've just laid off two people last week i'll give you a visual representation of why that had to happen just around this corner this is only half of the tables and chairs that this pub has had to lose from the inside area and 50 percent of the chairs and tables have had to go from outside as well let's go and meet mark and elaine now thank you for chatting to us thank you all of this lockdown has cost, and then these measures have cost too. How much are you down? Oh, it's a huge amount. I mean, we've invested thousands of pounds in all of the equipment that you've seen this morning, um, but equally our capacity is going to be hugely reduced. So at two metres, we were going to be at best at 25 to 30% of our normal capacity. The one metre means that we'll be obviously now much better, but we still believe that we're going to be somewhere between 50 and 60 percent worse than we were. I think it's important to say as well, Mark, that none of this, none of these measures, nobody's told you you have to do this. You've just done it off your own bat. Yeah, we've had to figure it out, um, make some leaps of faith, really. Weeks and weeks ago, setting up an app doesn't happen overnight, ordering screens, 
all you've got to you've got to get your order in early. So we did that weeks ago. You are ready to go. Do you think the customers are going to come back? They certainly are. There's think a so? lot of interest to come back. Yeah. Okay. As long as we're safe. As long as you're safe, and that's the key thing. Chris Whitty in the briefing last night was very keen to say if you think this is a measure that things are back to normal, you are wrong. Um, th you'll have to still be careful and follow the guidelines. Bars in Northern Ireland are going to open early July. Wales and Scotland are still deciding. Back to you. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. This really is going to be our new normal, at least in England for the moment. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, not all businesses in England will be reopening. Uh, we've been talking about this this morning as well. Indoor gyms and swimming pools remain closed, despite many of them already putting measures in place to try and protect staff and customers. Here's Tim Muffett. The uncertainty goes on and on. For indoor gyms like this one in Northampton, lockdown has meant no workouts, no weight training, no income. We're obviously disappointed by the news that we can't reopen our gyms on the 4th of July, but we're more disappointed for our colleagues and our members who we know are desperate to come back. Those who run this gym believe it could open safely. We've installed some screens between our treadmills. The purpose of these is to make sure that we can keep as much kit in action as possible whilst keeping our members as safe as possible. So the Perspex screens sit about two metres high, they're wrapped around the treadmills and our cleaning teams will be on hand to wipe them down regularly throughout the day. More screens are about to be installed. Each treadmill will be self-contained. Do you think that will detract from the workout experience? I think anything we can do at the moment that helps make our, our members feel safer is going to be a good thing. We've bought one of these for every gym, which is an electrostatic cleaning gun that at a push of a button sterilises a piece of equipment like this. And as numbers inside will be strictly controlled, gym members will be able to check them in advance. So they can quickly check this before they come down to see how busy or quiet the gym is, so they're guaranteed to get in without queuing. Expensive investment this gym's felt compelled to make. And whilst Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden tweeted yesterday that the government hopes indoor gyms can open in England in mid-July, the sector is calling for clarity. There are more than 7,000 gym and leisure facilities across the UK, with more than 10 million members. Now, collectively, they're thought to be worth more than £7 billion to the UK economy. Humphrey Cobbold runs the chain Pure Gym, which has more than 1 million members. These were described, I think, as sort of close proximity venues. Um, well, my average gym is about 17,000 square feet, which is about the size of five or six tennis courts. Um, and in my book, um, that is much less of a close proximity venue than the average pub, which is, what, seven or 800 square feet. So I am a bit confused by the application of science. We hear about the so-called Joe Wicks effect, people working out at home in their gardens. Do you think people will actually want to go back to a gym? I do believe that um, gyms provide and facilities provide a particular environment that people uh, want. Uh, there's nothing quite like a live exercise class. Uh, most people uh, don't have... Um, a uh, Olympic lift platform or a, a weight stack um, in their front room or in their bedroom. Most people don't have a treadmill at home. If there's one lesson that we've learned from the last few months, it's that your health and your fitness really does matter. But others believe indoor gyms should stay closed for now. Dr Claire Taylor's a microbiologist. The big dangers in the gym is the fact that people will be uh, touching lots of different surfaces, so there will be uh, obviously exercising, there'll be, there'll be sweat, people will be touching their face a lot um, and then potentially touching lots of different gym equipment. I mean, perspex screens may well um, help, but then you would imagine that, that the screens will end up covered, covered in uh, uh, kind of respiratory droplets um, and could end up being a real uh, potential site for, for contamination. One of the safest places to exercise is of course in the, in the outdoors where the risk of transmission is far reduced. Back in Northampton, the machines have been spaced out and spruced up. They just need people to use them. So do you think then that when people come back, there's, there's going to be some things, some changes which you've had to make, which could actually be better? Yeah, I'm really confident, especially in the weights area here, having a bit of marked out space that you can have as your own whilst you train could be really important. We're going to work so hard making sure that our, clean, our gyms are clean and hygienic. It's been a tough time for this sector. It's hoped the finish line isn't 